Wow, this is really exciting. First of all, we have the great Brandino. Hello, Warren. How are you, sir? I am marvelous, my friend. How are you? <laughs> well, I'm fine. You know, trying to wake up. <clears throat> I know. I'm sorry. I'm, I, That's all right. No, it's all good. The way it works is that you and I, we do this for a living. We play music and yes. record music for a living. Yes, sir. We're not prof I'm not a professional interviewer, as many of the people commenting will, will notice. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> so um, we're always doing this before sessions or before the beginning of the day. So I pre appreciate dragging you out on an early uh, Wednesday morning to come and talk to us. It's all good. And it's... also exciting, we're sitting on the couch. Yeah, man, well, I even like that better. Yeah, because normally we film that way with the, with the console in the background. Okay, well, that's okay. I, it's, I think it's more comfortable. A, it's more it's... comfortable, and B, it's more about you and less about the console. Because this isn't a unique interview for me because I've got... We've got a bass in your hands. So not only can we talk about the people you've worked with, the music you've made, mm -hmm. but maybe you can show us you know, some of the parts that you played. And you've got this beautiful bass. Firstly, tell me about this bass. What is this? It's a Warwick, it's a five string single cut. And uh, I think I was one of the first guys that kind of embraced this instrument for Warwick. And um, it's like a Federa has this, you know, mm -hmm. big piece of wood over here, which some has incredible sustain. Listen to the sustain. It's, it, it, it never stops ringing. <laughs> Go by, have a bite, come back, and it's still going. Yeah, you know, yeah, you know, you know, for about five hours, the, the low string rings. So, you know. It's still going. Yeah, it's, it's still going. I just right. muted it with my, my finger. So, basically, when they designed this bass, uh, <clears throat> I can't remember the year. It was at the NAM show, and I picked it up, and I was playing... I was doing a little ditty with one of my uh, <clears throat> blues guitar player friends at that point, and I told him I wanted this bass, and it was a pr prototype, and finally the next year they made it. They flew me to New York, and we did the first Fuss on the Bus with Warwick in New York and all that. And they Fuss on the Bus. Fuss on the Bus. And it had everybody. I mean, it was like, you know, I mean, everybody you could think of was on that bus. I mean, it was like Verdeen, Verdeen, White. Um, Chuck Rainey, Steve Bailey, wow. T.M. Stevens. I mean, it just went on and on, and we're all on this bus going someplace in New York. I don't remember on a bridge to shoot this picture of all of us, you know, on this, you know, on this the fuss on the bus. So we did. We were recording stuff, and you know, we just had it was a party. So Fantastic. they did. They did it about three years. So as far as the bass, I got this bass, got, you know, and um, <clears throat> when I came home. From New York, I was in first class, so they let me put this bass in the closet, you know. Nice. So that was it. So I've been kind of endorsing this instrument from that. I usually play a streamer back in the day with Aretha, but uh, the good thing about this bass... It's got incredible sustain. Yeah. You know, and, and one of the bands that I was working with Basically, I was doing a lot of fusion, so this kind of fit that. Which band? Uh, Brandino and Friends. Brandino and Friends. <laughs> <laughs> nice. You know, so I was doing this uh, a, a club gig down uh, Seventh Grand downtown, and it's a whiskey bar. You know, and on Monday nights, the, the policy used to be they had jazz groups. So I was either doing kind of straight ahead jazz, and I was pulling in people like uh, Tony. Austin, Andy Langham, Kamazi Washington, you know, I was bringing all these other kids in, either that or I was doing a fusion thing, you know, and playing kind of, uh, I would say, yeah, fusion back in the day, that kind of stuff. So I was picking up um, like some Herbie Hancock songs and stuff that I'd doing, right. doing remakes, like mm -hmm. Actual Proof, I did a, a, a totally different twist on that. Mm -hmm. I did a totally twist on, um, <clears throat> on Tell Me a Bedtime Story, which is on my new album, which I am, I, I brought you a copy, but uh, somebody took my briefcase, so I can't show it to you like that. But the bottom line is I'm, I'm going right. to give you my new album and all right. that stuff that has been uh, Grammy nominated and blah, 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 Congrats. blah, all that good stuff. So that's well, look, what's up with the bass. So it's all about basses. So what did you start on back in when you first started? You, you started up, did you start on upright, then transition <clears throat> to electric? No, I started playing bass when I was nine years old. Wow. I played piano at four, five years old. Right. Played saxophone at seven because I was in a family band. And I wanted to be a drummer, but because of my handicap, my father said, no, you don't want to do that. So they needed a bass player. So I was elected to be the bass player. So my brother taught me, yo, this is a G, this is a C, this is an F, B flat. And back then, mm -hmm. 
they didn't in the in the sixties there was no amplifiers. So you had to have those little turntables and put your ear <laughs> to hear the notes. Boo. Or I don't know if that's the right note. Boo boo boo. You know what I mean? Seriously, you mm -hmm. had to try to sing the note to find out where it is. So um <clears throat> right ear training. Yeah, well, yeah, because you would hear everything and hear all the other partials of the band or the guitar plays doing that. The boom, doom, ba doom, doom. The drum is doing that. Okay, okay, what's the bass like? Boom, doom. <laughs> you know, oh, that's my job. That's all I have to do. That's all you have to play. Okay. Yeah. You know, so <laughs> it was that kind of thing, but I played a starter on an electric bass. And, and one of my teachers, when I studied classical flute at 13 and during high school and all that, uh, people would say, you're, kid, you're not a bass player in play, unless you play upright. Oh. And I go, well, you don't really hear upright on the radio. You're not a, you're not a bass player if you don't play upright. That mm -hmm. was it. There's no questions. So, <clears throat> I, you know, man, you know, it took four years in high school to save $300 to buy a lot of money in the a, 60s. Yes, to buy a to buy a check base, which mm. I don't know where it is. I wish I could find it, but that's all right. It's in the atmosphere someplace, so that I could actually have a base. So what happened was, <clears throat> I got the base. My teacher told me there was a teacher down the street from him in Watts that was a bass player. That was Mr. Hamilton. I studied um, with Milton Hall. That was my flute teacher. So I went down there, and the bottom line, I'm playing this thing. And I'm, I'm playing this bass, and I'm telling this guy, he's a Dixieland bass player. And he's saying, and I said, man, I, I'm trying to play this bass. Man, but if, man, I, man, I can't get it in tune. He says, kid, you need to get a classical teacher. You need to find a real teacher, classical teacher, and go through and buy the Samandel books. Mm -hmm. I said, well, Samandel said, those are the Bibles. There's a book one and two. You need to go through those, both books. If you do that, then basically you know the bass. You've went through all the stuff, all the things, exercise, you know, now you know the whole bass. So I ended up doing that, and um, that's where I got, from that gentleman, that's where I got my 58 that I had done a uh, video interview on, I guess it came out last week. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they talked about that story. So bottom line is I ended up finally a teacher in Seal Beach that took me because I'm still young, and after about a year, I was eating everything he was giving me up. So I was going, he was, okay, we do these two pages. So when I go back to the lesson, I'm doing six pages because I'm bored. Because mm -hmm. I already know how to play bass, but I don't know how to play acoustic bass. But by, by that time, it kind of sunk in where I was going with it. So once you got to hand position and shifting and thumb position, you know, I was eating up like six, seven, eight pages, you know. And this guy's like, you know, he's choking. I don't have enough time to go through in, in an hour lesson. I go, well, yeah, but I did all this. So basically he called <clears throat> his teacher, Nat Gangursky, who was the old man that ran this town, was first call, mm -hmm. played under Toscanini in oh, Chicago. Wow. It was, he was, a, I think he was Nat Gangursky. I don't know if he was a German Jew, uh, Russian Jew or whatever, but he played under Toscanini. He, was, he played, him and Red Calendar were the first ones to actually do silent films that they would double, one would double on tuba and one play string bass. They both played tuba and string bass. That's where it started from, doing all the movies in Hollywood. So he was the old man, and he didn't take a student or take anybody unless they were over 21. He didn't deal with kids. How old were you at the time? Yeah, so my teacher called and he mm -hmm. said, you need to take this kid. Right. He says, I can't handle this guy. Every time I give him stuff, he eats up the pages. He's done, you know, we don't even have enough to cover the stuff in 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 the um <clears throat> in the lesson, yep. you know, and I was hungry because the bottom line, my parents had divorced, you know, and by eighteen, I don't know where I was going to live. I didn't know what was going to happen. I said, "Man, look, you're going to have to be a professional musician. You better get your your stuff together." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you almost caught me. You got to get your stuff together because I might be homeless. Seriously, yep. you know, it's not like that. So, man, I mean, I ate, I ate, ate music twelve hours a day, and we had a summer camp. That was, Cerrito started a music camp, and, and basically, I think I used somebody else's address because you had to be in that district I see. and all that. But Pancho Sanchez, the Bondo brothers, we were all, they went. They were in Norwalk, I was in Compton, and then from, I was in Willowbrook, born in Willowbrook, raised, raised in partly in Compton, and then I went to Paramount. And basically, all the kids 
that was the place where you go through the summer. So it was like a summer camp. Your mother get rid of you because they don't want to see you for three months because, you know, they didn't see you for nine months because, you know, it's all that scenario. So, no, seriously. So I met Pancho Sanchez and the Banda brothers, mm -hmm. and Jeff Jorgensen, uh, you know, all these people. We went to summer camp. So Incredible. we went to school. We Basically, I went to school 20, 12 months out of the year. You know, but that's how we learned how to read. That's how we learned all the big band stuff. I mean, in Dick Grove at that time, who was a big TV movie writer here, mm -hmm. basically he had, you know, online Dick Grove courses you could take. So all that was developing. I mean, all that was going on. So there was so much music going on. Mm -hmm. And every, everybody was just saying, well, okay, where do you live, man? I live in East LA. Where do you live, man? I live in Eagle Rock. Where do you live, man? I live in Compton. Where do you live? Well, I live in Watts. It didn't make any difference. It was a summer camp. So we had, we had, they had the top, in the top, they had the top neophonic band mm -hmm. in the country back Amazing. then. So basically, all the music, all the, as far as me studying upright, I studied with uh, Nat Gangursky, and he took me th from the back. Everything I learned, he made me go from the back, the front of the book again, and everything was saying, look, kid, look, I've been doing this, I'm retired, you know, and he says, 90% will be whole notes. 10% will be stuff you can't play, so don't worry about it. <laughs> no, seriously, and to this day, it's really the truth because the bottom line, doing a low, a long bowl and counting at 60 beats with a metronome and trying to count it out to do a long bowl, either 12 counts, 20 counts, to this day is everything mm -hmm. because you never know when that's going to happen. And in an orchestra or even on a record date, if you call it, if they have bass on it, because usually they just do... Um, cello, violas, and violins. But if you get that call, usually they want that, and you're just doing them uh, underneath this bed, you know, you know, and you're going, and the violin, you know, you know, but no, so that but you was don't true. want to miss it by a knife, well, well, you can't, you yeah. can't miss it, you know. Yeah. So that, that yep. was kind of scenario. So I started on electric, got classically trained on flute. And then got classically trained on, on on acoustic bass. Now, because a lot of bass players are going to be watching this. Now, you're talking about, what was the name of the book system that you went through? Samandel. Those are two classical books. Samandel 1 and 2. The French is Belay, which mm -hmm. he has a whole series, mm -hmm. about 18 volumes. That I'm are assuming not... all those books are still available. No, they're not. They're not? No, Samandel is. The Belay is supposed to be out of print. Oh, wow. And even the flute books that I have would out, outis. Samandel. Yes, yeah, Samandel. S-I-M-A-N... DL. Okay. And Samandel's still available. And some of the Ray Brown books, but but the Belay, which are European, supposedly they're out of print. So I want to ask you a quick base question. Yeah. Is there something that you remember from those books that you still practice every day? Like a warm-up? Is there anything that you could share that you think is pretty essential? Yeah. for the Bass Alliance with Jeff Hugo from mm -hmm. Six Feet Under, mm -hmm. uh, Jacob Eckelman, and this little kid, Jason L Leopold Jr., that's about 16 that I'm pulling him in, you know, to get his feet wet and all this. But the big thing about that is that they're basically, from a Ray Brown point of view, his tense that he still yeah. was known for on Upright, basically, I started doing this, and and it's, it's just a nice little melody. Mm -hmm. And it's basically showing basically the tenth and the octave below. You know, so I came up with this thing for Bass Player Live uh, 2016, you know, and I started playing with this kid, 
and we were at a base, some kind of base company, and uh, we're playing this, and uh, man, he started ripping all the stuff, slapping, all the, all the, you know, he was going all over the place, you know. So we started getting this little thing, and we got a, or whatever, I think it's like 1,700 views that people keep looking at this, and it sure. keeps building. So, you know, I figured, well, let me make a song out of it. So hopefully this will work for the ba this base alliance project that I'm doing with uh, Jeff Hugo. So, but that, that basically, and, and as far as scales and stuff like that, Going between electric and acoustic, they're two different instruments, you know. So there's you, basically different exercises that you do on electric than different than you're doing upright. The whole hand position. The hand position, the thumb, the, you know, this, doing that. Because, like, Steve Bailey does his thing with the thumb, and he mm -hmm. does, like, if he's playing mm -hmm. on an upright, he does all that stuff on his fretless and all that, which is very interesting, you know, mm -hmm. concept and all that. So... <clears throat> Everybody's got different kind of techniques. I noticed your right hand, you're not anchoring your thumb like this. You actually well, what happened is I cut my finger the other day ah. when I was feeding my dog. I got two 70-pound boxers. <laughs> ah. And I have, this, if I leave a bag of food out, there's a hole in it. <laughs> Seriously. So I had to get a trash can to put it in there. I had to get a 50-pound <laughs> trash can to put a 35-pound uh, bag of dog food in there right. with a 25-pound with a 20, weight. Right. You know, that I actually pick up every day <laughs> and put over the food. So if they knock it down, they're not going to knock it down this barrel. I'm serious. They've done it before. So what happened is the other day I did that and uh, picked it up with the wrong finger and I cut this and it's uh. like, that's why I'm, I'm kind of doing it. The technique is a different way because it cut there. Yeah. And, and I was telling Alex, I said it's to a point that the other day I didn't know that it was that bad and I started playing and it started bleeding. I'm looking at my finger bleeding. So I had to go through a whole thing for a couple of days. So. You know, I'm kind of alternating yep. my right hand technique, if that's what you want to call it. Well, you're still sounding beautiful, so well, that's really well. Uh, you know, hopefully it'll it'll work out. You know, I'm, I'm a little handicapped, but I'm trying to get over the handicap for the interview. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Now, I'm guessing you're a GK user, bearing in mind you're wearing a. Oh yeah, well yeah, they give me clothes, man. You know, it's you know it's spring, man. You know, they got my little. My little hat with my little bling bling. Hey, Forrest, the, I got the bling bling on. You know, all that. But, you know, they, they make clothes, man. They make clothes. And it's like, you know, it, you know how it is here. I, I mean, love this little GK amp you brought. Oh, this, yeah, it's an MB112 uh, that they made for me. It's a combo yeah. that I had asked them to make from the original one that they made that was uh, the aluminum mm -hmm. that all the upright guys. And I said, you need to make it deeper, twice as deep. Ah, and, put a, and put a four ohm speaker in it so you get twice the wattage. So basically, it's a 200 watt amp because it's got a four ohm speaker in it. So you're raising up that, the, the amperage. Yep. And that's all you need for upright. So when oh, you're using this for upright? Oh, I use this for upright. Yeah, oh, I wow. usually, yeah, I usually bring a big stack. I think Alex has been down to seventh grand when I did the fusion. Yep. And I've got like, you know, uh, I've got like a, a 15 on top of a four, 410 cabinet, and I'm running like a hundred, uh, probably a thousand watts, you know, uh, 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 1100 RB, you know, or one of the small uh, 800, you know, five pound, you know, amps at the main, you know, which is the MB800 to MB500, it's 500 watts, sure. you know. But for something like this and for something small studio, this works out great, you know, because they can mic the amp. You know, if they want some more highs, they can put it in the board or whatever to take it from the from the base. Yeah, we'll show a shot of the amp, but it's like this big. Oh yeah, 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 yeah and it's two hundred watts. It's fantastic. <laughs> so, what did you start on electric bass wise? Now you ended up on the Warwick. Yeah, the first bass I had, the first bass I have. When I was nine years old, I have these pajamas. I got this picture from the sixties. <laughs> I got these pajamas. They're white. And they got red all over. My mother bought them for me. And so I'm undressed with these red looking whatever on this white, red. And I'm sitting there. I got a St. George base, which was a $20 base, which I found out that St. George is out of, originally out of upper state New York. Mm -hmm. And what he used to do, swap meets were real big in the 60s here. So he all he would supply was guitar, bass, no amps, and drums that were St. George drums. And he used to sell them to all 
the, the uh, uh, you know, the, what did I just say? Not Up and coming kids. Oh, yeah, no, but, but it, no, but swap flea, meets, not flea market, flea, swap meets. Right. So he supplied all the swap meets mm -hmm. all over the country. That was a big thing. There was swap meets in, in the music, in the, in the actual uh, movie theaters that you used to go in the car. When you had to go to the theater and put the mm -hmm. thing in the car over here and put it over here, right? Well, on Saturdays, they had swap meets. And that's what they did. So they had everybody selling all kind of crap. So, you know, when I got in the band, I needed a bass. My father said, okay, it's time to get you a bass, okay? You're going to be in a family band. So he went to the swap meet. It was $20, and that was a lot of money. So mm -hmm. I have this big bass that's bigger than me. I got this picture, and I'm sitting like this. <laughs> and I got to, I don't know how to play the damn thing. I'm trying to hold on. It's got one big pickup, one of those big You have old... this picture? Yeah, I have the picture. At your house? I have the picture online someplace in my archive. Yeah, I can send it to you. We need to get this picture. Yeah, next. you know, and it's, I'm sitting here smiling the Christmas tree here, mm -hmm. and I'm sitting here smiling. I got, I got a bass. I don't know how to play it, but I got a bass, and it's and it's bigger than me. It's actually <laughs> bigger than me, you know. So I had that bass, but it was so big. Over here, after a while, it was like real hard to play. So then we went to Downey Music, which is in Downey, California, and I could have bought a Hofner or an Eco Bass or Echo Bass Italian. And I should have bought the Hoffman because it had been worth six grand, uh, $10,000. Sure. You know, it was a big bass. And I ended up getting that. I mean, the Eco, because it was easier to play. Right. My hands weren't. Was it a three quarter scale? It, you know what I think it is? Yeah. I think it is a kind of a three or because I, I, couldn't get, I couldn't get strings here. Right. I had to order them from Downey Music, I had to order from Italy. And they had to come from Italy to Downey Music. Then they said, Your strings are here. I'd go pick them up. It was that kind of thing. So um, I still have the bass, and I, one of my friends, oh, nice. Chris Bristol, who ran Roland for years, I think he, um, he knows about the bass. I, I'm going to give it to him because he's going to have to redo the binding, all that. It just kind of fell apart. I mean, it's over 50 years old. I bought it in the 60s, so it just fell apart, and it's a hollow body. But it's got the little switch here, oh, really? or, you know, that you go between both pickups, backup pickups. Oh, yeah, it was slick. We need to get a it was real of slick of this. You know, oh, it was real slick. Beautiful. You know, but it was real light, and I could because I used to sing in the family band. Mm -hmm. So we all sing. So I had this little B bass, and we're playing all, you know, we're playing top 40, you know, we're playing, you know, soul music. We're playing all that. Even when I produced Robbie Krieger on, on his 2011 album, I said, Robbie Krieger, you know, I remember when you came out with Light My Fire, and he's like looking at me. He says, are you that old Brandino? I go, yeah, I know I look good. My mama has good blood. <laughs> you know, but I said, yeah, I remember this. So he's like looking at me, and I said, I said, you guys had it on. You had the short version on for a year. Short version. It was three minutes and 30 seconds. The next year, you did the extended with the, the organ solo, the yep. whole organ solo. And he's looking at me, and I said, that went for another year. And he's looking at me. You know, you already, you know this shit. You know this stuff, don't you? And I go, yeah, you know this stuff, don't you? And I go, yeah, I played, that's all I did is radio music. And he goes, you know, you're right. And I said, so, you know, Robbie, you know, how much money did you make? Well, I can't really say. But, you know, Robbie, you know, he says, Robbie, so, um, Robbie, you know, blah, 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 Robbie. You know, well, yeah, well, I can't, you can't really say this, Kev. But anyway, what he told me, the song was covered 226 times. Wow. And he gets a royalty check every year, besides all the other royalty checks, but he gets that royalty check for that one song. And he said that Jose Feliciano, when he did Light My Fire, mm -hmm. and he did it in Spanish, it sold more than any of the Doors versions of the song. Seriously. Well, I can believe it. You know, Spanish so, market is huge. Yeah well, yeah. yeah, well, you never thought about it back in the 60s, but it was, you know, because mm -hmm. when you think about Julian Glaze and all these other Latino artists, mm -hmm. basically it's a worldwide, worldwide market. Mm -hmm. But back then you didn't know that. But back then he was selling all over the place in, you know, whatever, South America, Central America, all that, you know. So, you know, nobody's going to argue with publishing money. Come on, man. That's no, how you buy those big mansions. <laughs> so buy my record so I can buy me a big mansion, okay? <laughs> Jeez. <Whew. laughs> so, so now you were you were of Aretha for years. I was with Aretha 20... for 22 years. I started years. with in 78, and I left the band in 2000. And the thing about that was <clears throat> one of my friends, uh, Harold Mason, not Harvey Mason, Harold Mason from Kalamazoo, Michigan, He's one of the drummers that he told me that basically uh, got a degree. He, he learned how to read and went to college. 
So he said basically when Motown moved out here, before Motown moved out here, and they would send out some of the Motown groups to get covered in the 60s, the bottom line, they would send him out because he could read the charts. So if he had to play with the Tonight Show, he could read that or whatever, play the play on, play off, and then the artist would come out, he'd be already sitting in the drum chair and he'd, he'd play the right beat. So I don't know if they brought a bass player out. I don't know if Jameson came out with him or not. I never really asked him, but he told me that's how basically how he ended up moving. When Motown moved, he moved out here, which obviously Aretha's not on Motown. She wasn't, she was basically, uh, I think Columbia originally and then Atlantic and blah, blah, blah. But uh, you asked me how I got the gig. So I used to do shows when I was still in school and in college doing shows with Harold because I could read and I could double. So I was coming up into town from the hood, from South Central, coming up to L.A. doing stuff at at, at, at Smokehouse, and they had cabaret shows back then. So I was doing that, doubling, trying to make money, going to school and all that. And finally, uh, you know, I, I got to a point, I said, man, you know, I can't crack into this business. And, you know, and these guys want me to move up into town because I lived an hour out of, out of town, so realistically they're saying you're too far out. Mm -hmm. Nobody's gonna call you because if there's a last minute call, they wanna know that you're within, you know, Hollywood area that you know you can make this gig. If, a gig, if you get a call for a gig to sub for somebody at five, at five o'clock, mm -hmm. the gig's at seven. Sure. You're in the hood, it ain't gonna happen. Maybe from six. Yeah. yeah, you know, you'll never make it. So <clears> all yeah. this is going on, and I'm trying to figure a way out of this, so I go, man, I gotta do this. He says, well, you know what? He already knew that I had played with the Tommy Dorsey band. That's why I went out, because a lot of the Sicilian guys were here in L.A. at uh, a place called The Cellar. And it was run by a, a drummer that had a group, Fusion, Transfusion Group, which I had met Charlie Owens, and I had met the alto player for the Zappa band. At that time, they were in this band. So it was like a jazz rock group, Fusion. Right. That was the beginning of that. You know, so, you know, all this was happening and I met these guys and I met Harold and Harold called me one day. He says, you're going to get a call. I said, okay, I'm going to get a call for a TV thing. And I said, okay, he said, so make sure you get to call. Make sure you stay by the phone, you know, and make sure you get this call and accept the call. I said, okay. So I get this call and they're saying blah, 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 blah. So I get this call. I said, this is uh, HB's office. Uh, HB, HB who? H.B. Barnum. Okay, okay. Wow, okay. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, we have this TV show uh, with Chevy Chase and the, uh, Chevy Chase, now, uh, Chevy Chase is the guy, right? Then the uh, Goldie Hawn. So this is TV, they're doing this TV special with this. And so they're calling me to do this. So I get a call, yeah, do you play electric bass? Blah, 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 yeah, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Can you read? Yeah, yeah, well, you've been recommended by, by Harold Mason. So I go do the TV show and blah, 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 blah. And so they're looking at me and I, I was able to read the show and everything was, so the conductor, everything went fine with the show. It was like three or four days. So he comes over to me and says, do you ever go on the road? And I said, uh, yeah, depending on who it is. So it says Aretha Franklin. I said, okay, so, so what about the money? It's all about the money, you know? And he says, well, you know, blah, 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 blah. He says, are you willing to travel? I said, well, yeah, I'm traveling, you know, if it pays right. So, you know, I get a call, you know, and I get a call and blah, 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 blah. And then I get this call. He said, well, you know, we, we got this thing in, we got this thing in uh, Reno and um, we're going to audition you there. I said, okay. So I went to Reno, did like five days. And uh, Aretha said she liked the way I played. And... Um, Basically, it was a transition. It was when she had got first with Arista, when Clive had signed her to Arista. So it was, it was Marcus and Luther doing that record. Mm -hmm. You know, Freeway of Love. It was the first thing. So basically, I, 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 he says, you need to come pick up this book and blah, blah, blah. And there's some stuff on there that, you know, you need to check out because they're doing this new style of playing, which was slap bass you know, octa divider, synth bass, and all, you know, in the combination. Mm -hmm. We're doing synth and electric bass. That's how they're recording, basically, going into the 80s. So, bottom line is, I got the call. Harold was on the gig. Had you, were you slapping by that point? Yeah, yeah, because I taught my, you know, my student that everybody knows, Robert Trujillo, mm -hmm. from Metallica. Right. That was my student at Dick Grove School of Music. I was uh, Max Bennett had called me in to start summer for him. And then Max says, you know what, Kev? 
I'm not going to do this anymore. You take over. So then I ended up, the first year I'm subbing from Max, the second year, now I'm the head of the department at Dick Grove. So at this point, I'm doing, you know, now I'm teaching these kids. And these kids are coming in and slap is in. And I'm, I'm, so I'm learning this style from Tony Opperheimer has this book called Slap It. Orange book, Slap, slap it. it. And it's got, <laughs> and it's got a C, it's got a little C, not a C. It's got a little, it looks like a CD like this, but you put, it's a, it actually for a phonograph, you could play. A mini disc. Yeah, a mini, a mini disc or whatever you call it. So, you know, I'm getting all this stuff for the kids, compiling, I'm saying, well, I don't know how we're gonna get this together, you know, that I'm new at this. So, you know, it's like. <laughs> you know, something like that, it's real simple, but it breaks it down like a drum book. It's almost like, uh, Louis Belson's drum book. It had all the 16s, how to thumb up, how to slap, pull off, and all this. So, you know, um, I'm bringing this in to Dick Grove School of Music. So, Robert Trujillo was one of my students. So, I'm passing these things out. He must have been young in those days. Oh, yeah, he was young, man. He was a surfer, the whole bed, living in Venice. And all this, and I'm saying, so what do you guys want to do? Oh, I want to do R&B. One of the kids say, okay, well, I want to play rock and roll. This, that's what, that's what uh, uh, Robert's telling me. So I'm telling, look, you guys, whatever's going on, if you guys make some money in the industry, make sure you buy your mother a house. Just make sure you take care <laughs> of your mother and buy her a house. So seriously. Beautiful. Yeah. So with Robert, I'm finding out like years later, I'm opening up this bass player magazine. I'm seeing on the front cover, I'm looking at this guy with this long hair down, you know. He's like a big guy. Yeah, you know, yeah. he's, he's real muscles, yeah. muscular and everything. And he used to surf early in the morning before he came to class, because class started at 10 o'clock. So he's surfing at like 6 o'clock in the morning, you know, Venice or wherever out there, and then driving his car to come to, come to school. So, you know, um, I'm looking at this magazine, and I'm going, okay, this guy's playing uh, Suicidal Tendencies, and then he's playing with Ozzy Osbourne, and now he's got the gig with Metallica. And I'm going, Robert Trujillo. I said, I know this damn, I know this name. I know this name, Trujillo. And I'm looking at this guy. So I'm calling around. I mean, who's this Robert? Man, you know, blah, 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 blah. I said, who's this guy? Oh, man, you're doing, man, he's a rock star. Blah, 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 blah. I said, I think I taught this kid. So I opened up my, my Dick Grove book of all my, all my students, and I'm looking at this, just Robert Trujillo. So the, that correlation with that, why I went there, is because I did an album in 2000 or 2002 with Giampaolo Savoni and Fabrizio Grossi. I don't mm -hmm. know if you know Fabrizio. He's a bass player. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, there are two Italians from Italy. So whatever way we hooked up through g &L because I was doing marketing for g &L. My company was mm -hmm. doing marketing for g &L. So basically the owner... Uh, uh, or the vice president, Dave McLaren, says, oh, you know these Italian guys, they think you know them. You, you guys are all the same, you know. He says, you're all the same because my name is Brandino. Right. So you're all the same. You know, must know each other. So I meet up with him and all that. So we ended up doing <coughs> a, a, a tribute record uh, of um, Jimi Hendrix and a tribute record. Um, oh, man, you're going to slap me. Uh, what's the other one? Man, sorry, guys, you got to look it up. But then anyway, <laughs> we did two albums. One was Hendrix, and another one was another group, and we, and, and we were doing covers. Mm -hmm. So they called me in and said, why don't you do this, blah, blah, blah. Then they said, blah, blah, blah. I said, well, we're looking for rock guys, Kev. You know, we'll do something. You'll do, we'll, we'll use you as Aretha Franklin's bass player, because at the time, I had just left the group. And so that scenario was still fresh. And I want to also say that basically when I took Aretha's gig, or I actually started playing with Aretha, I I'd actually, uh, uh, James Jameson Sr. had basically retired from doing Aretha, you know? Oh. So that was a big honor because obviously cool. he was a Motown guy and all this. So getting back to the rock and roll thing, so I'm doing this album and they're saying, well, we need a lock. Well, man, you know Marco Mendoza? Yeah, I know Marco Mendoza. He plays with it. Yeah, well, man, we need to get him. Okay, so they asked me, yeah, blah, blah, blah. I said, well, you know, when I found out one of my students there's Robert Trujillo, and they go, what do you mean Robert Trujillo? I said, yeah, he was one of my students. 
So, you know, the thing is, he said, well, you got to get him because, you know, it's, it's a name thing. You got to have all these things. So, you know, you're, you're a soul guy, Kev, or you're a jazz guy. You're not a rocker, but we need this. This is a rock and roll. It was Led Zeppelin. It was Led Zeppelin and Hendrix. So basically, we did this thing. I think that's right, but I'm not sure. That whatever. So anyway, <laughs> we do this album, and I'm calling Robert. So I got a number, and I got an old number in my book from, from looking at it. So I'm calling this number. I'm calling it like three months. I'm calling this number. So I finally get someday. I call like 10 o'clock in the morning. Hello? Yes, yeah, this Robert Trujillo. Yeah, who's this? This is your teacher from Dick Grove School of Music, Kevin Brandon, a.k.a. Brandino. Hey, Kev, how you doing? I said, Robert, where the, where the heck you been? <laughs> man, I, I, I finally found my phone. I've been calling you three months. Man, the phone, I couldn't find my phone. Well, where did you find the phone? It was under my bed. Okay. Well, this, Robert, this is what's up. We're doing this tribute to Led Zeppelin and uh, Jimi Hendrix. Fabricio, if I'm wrong, you better call Warren, okay, and tell him straight, okay, because I don't, can't remember but anyway, so we're doing this, and we're telling, telling them, and I said, they want you to be on this project. Marco Mendoza, there's all, it's a rock thing. So I call him, and blah, 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 and Trey, what is it, Trey Daniel from P.O.D. Pod, P.O.D., that group out of San Diego mm -hmm. that was like rock and rap. I had Trey come up and all that. So in my studio, that's what we're doing. We are doing ADATs back then, you yeah. know. So we are doing that and, you know, doing that situation, so... I figured, I know I went off on a tangent, but I figured I had to say that, you know, you know, the great Robert Trujillo. He came, though, and he came and played and he was oh amazing. Oh yeah, he came and played, he nailed it. So basically, um, I have like an online academy and yeah. I asked just the academy members for some questions. Only yeah. yesterday. So okay. did you get some questions? I got some questions. Oh, you got some questions from some, some guys. Okay, Yeah. okay, I better be on my best behavior, good. <laughs> well, we have a lot of, I mean, this in these days with with like production and learning how to record and stuff like that right. because the, because the equipment is so inexpensive to the way it was when you and I were kids when right. it was like studios like this were a million dollars and yep. and you know nobody could record even basic demos were cassettes you yeah know? You, you know what I'm talking yeah. about so now you're getting every guy that's coming up that's a bass player a drummer or a guitar player they're becoming producers and engineers yeah as well mm -hmm. as being musicians right so we have a lot of musicians so the first one is uh, David A.K.A. Spider Man says, when recording electric bass, what amp are you using? We talked about that. Yeah. Um, are you, you always using the GK? Yeah. He asked, he asked about uh, the Ampegs, the Portaflexes, and the flip tops. Yeah, yeah, uh, Back in the day? Yeah, 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 yeah. That with technology and with all the modeling of amps that they got, like IK Multimedia, all that stuff, mm -hmm. realistically now, basically, uh, if you can find an old countryman, direct box, that's, that was, his that was the stuff that everybody used. Now, I know there's all these other new brands. Mm -hmm. I haven't bothered with them because I have some countrymen mm -hmm. that basically they were, they were the bomb back then. So I use, if I need to go there, I'll put a battery in there, put them in because for whatever reason, every studio that was ever in L.A. used countrymen. Mm -hmm. And I was able to get two of them. So I basically used that if I knew to do a DI, meaning from the bass, Directly sure. that, then it goes to the board. Then no, you, there's a line out out of it. So now you can go into my my MB, sure. uh, you know, twelve single twelve cabinet, mic that. So you got that sound. So that, at that point, you've got versatility of basically either a tube amp or a tr uh, solid state amp or whatever you want to call it. Sure. The amplifier section of it. Great. Warm, but it usually you want to get the punch from the amp. That's what it's all about. And then you want to get the high end and the clarity from the DI. That's usually what happens. Great. Yeah. Great. Thanks for asking. So, yeah. And Terry Doyle says, uh, do you have any favorite EQ settings on your amp for different bass guitars? Or do you change them depending on the material, um, other instruments? I usually run everything flat. You run everything on flat? On my bass and on my amp. Hmm. I run everything flat. Because what happens is, if um, once I do that, it has a consistent sound like this. So when the engineer or whoever's going to mix it, they're going to dial it in. If they get a clean, solid signal, which you need for bass anyway, sure. then they're going to EQ it and put it where it needs to be if you're playing rock or if you're playing funk, playing soul, avant-garde, whatever. They're, they have the flexibility, which is what their job is, to tailor-made that bass sound to what they want. Seriously. And right. obviously... 
Depend on what bass you bring in. If I bring a 61 jazz bass that has a certain sound, it's still flat. It might be wide open, but they'll adjust that because they want that sound. Like if I'm doing a blues album, I'll either bring a 58 P bass or a 61 jazz bass. And it's got all original stuff on it. And it's got that sound, just period. Now, if I'm doing fusion or newer stuff, that's why I went to Warp because I couldn't build a bass back in the 70s when I was building basses that could sound as good as this. Because you got all this German technology, wood, all this. I mean, you can't compete. I mean, it's just, it's, 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 it's a Rolls Royce of the bass, mm -hmm. period. Oh, it's beautiful. You know. That's great. Um, AJ says, I'm a drummer who also plays bass. What advice can you or would you give drummers from a bass player's perspective? Like if you had to tell a drummer anything, what would you tell him? To play, to, to play drums with a bass player or mm -hmm. for them to play bass as a drummer? No, no, no. When you're talking to the drummer. Oh, yeah. Oh, you mean how to play the line? Yeah. Man, the bottom line, hopefully you know how to groove. Yeah. I mean, that's the bottom line. And, and usually... If a bass player is, is really round, well-rounded, usually if he knows that the drummer's limited, he'll find something that'll work together mm -hmm. because it's really about the drummer and the bass player working together. Mm -hmm. So there's no ego there. It's like, well, I've done five, five million records. There ain't nothing about that. It's basically getting a pocket, getting a groove, and, and getting a tight you know, groove between the drummer and the bass player, no matter what the music is. It's always that. You know, and hopefully, you know, there won't be a, um, a battle going on. You know, it, everybody will be happy. I mean, that's what it is. It's, it's trying to play music. So hopefully you guys will have some kind of, you know, unity and a bond because that's what it's all about. That's why a lot of drummers or bass players prefer playing with certain drummers or bass players because they already have a chem chemistry. Now then, you must have had situations where you're playing with a younger guy. Yeah. And... What is a sort of a common thing that you find if you are giving advice that you're saying to them? Usually I tell them to relax <laughs> because a lot of them usually they'll be pushing on the beat. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's good because I've been told uh, when I've worked in different clubs like 7th Grand downtown and I'll get a, all the guys are young. They're in their 30s. And one of my friends that uh, Milton Guti Gutierrez who mixed my record, uh, who works at the bridge. And he's a younger guy and he's a bass player, but he's an engineer all the time. And he goes, man, Kev, when you get those young guys, man, they, they definitely put a B vitamin shot in your <laughs> arm. You know, and, and, and what happens is my style changes so that I can basically play with them mm -hmm. because they're gonna just play what they wanna play, you know, blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's, it's a give and take in situation, but usually with, with younger drummers, you try to tell them to relax because you have the gig, you don't have to prove nothing to me. All we're trying to do is play music and groove this music, whatever it is. Yeah. That's, so that's the advice I give younger guy, drummers. I was thinking when you were talking about this earlier, about tempos and stuff yeah. and playing whole notes. Right. I remember an old mentor of mine, a guy called Oli Alcock, he said to me, he goes, you're not gonna be able to play 60 BPM until you're in your 40s. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. That's true, and that's why, you know, I've been doing, I, I worked, with H.B. Barnum for years, who was a conductor, did all the TV stuff with him, and, and Benjamin Wright that wrote all the strings for the, for the Thriller record mm -hmm. for Michael Jackson. And I know him because we used to, he, used to, he, he was the uh, MD for Gladys Knight. So Aretha and Gladys Knight, we go into New York and Gladys just left, or Gladys coming in after us. So I've known Benjamin for years. And, you know, he, he's from Mississippi and my people are from New Orleans, so there's a southern bond there, you know. And um, basically, Outkast was one of the first things I did when they, when they won in 2000, best record of the year, blah, blah, blah. That was my first Grammy. And he had called me in. He says, well, Kev, I know you play Lucky Pace and you read, blah, but can you play upright? Blah, blah, blah. So that's when I commissioned Eastman Music for an, a five-string upright because he writes parts oh, wow. like a five-string electric bass. And trying to do this with an orchestra bass is real hard. The one that you saw when we did the stuff for Lewitt, mm -hmm. you know, I had that extension on because I did that for real. I had just got the bass mm -hmm. and I was breaking it in and all that. And it has that extension. It's a big orchestra bass. But Eastman had, has five string uprights. Wow. And I did that because I've been working with Well I Am. We started doing something in January. We're supposed to start something later on this month. And uh, the conductor, first thing he did, the first note was a low D was here. And there's 
12 people, there's probably about 12, 15 people in, and I'm the only bass player. But I'm doing this. But I'm doing that, I'm doing it, playing like that in time with a bow. Boom, boom, do, 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 do. So basically, I told Ben, I'm gonna get a five string bass. So I started using five string bass on this, all the stuff that he was writing for, Usher, uh, uh, Mary J. Blige, um, some of the stuff we did with, uh, what was it? I think it was uh, uh, Beyonce, we did a duet, uh, was one of the duet tributes for um, Luther Vandross, so it was a Stevie Wonder and Beyonce duet that was a number one hit, blah, blah, blah. So basically I finally got a five string upright. It took about four years to really get it so that it really would speak mm -hmm. and went through four sets of strings. Uh, uh, with uh, uh, two of my um, Luthers, John Peterson and Ralph Acala. So we worked on these bases and finally they settled using Diodario Kaplan strings. Mm -hmm. They worked, you know, so that's what I use on that. You know, I use that upright and I use that on, on basically I've been using that consistently on all these hip hop tracks, you know from 2000 up until 2017 now. Sure. That's the bass I go in on using because if I got a low note or I have to do a drone at the end of a song and they want a low C or they want a low B, you know, like we did something for Rihanna for the uh, uh, for VMAs or something and I asked the conductor, I said, uh, you know, do you want a low B at the end of here? And we had four basses in the section. He goes, well, 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 do you have a low C? I said, no, I have a five string bass. You're from Germany. The Berlin Symphony uses five string, all the five bass players in the Berlin Symphony play five string bass. Mm. They all do. That's the, that. number, that's the number one orchestra in the world. Right. Thank you. So I said, I got a five string bass. And he goes, well, hell, heck yes. You know, if you do that solo, you know, at the end of the song, I'm doing like this and drop down, brah. You know, and the, all the bass players are like, they done jumped. They actually jumped because when the bass, when I hit that, it just filled up the room. You know, so. That's what that, as far as that with the five string up, uh, electric bass and five string upright. I might have went a ring around the rosy here, but it's all right. basically. Great information. But yeah, that's basically what happened. That might have been one of the questions that the guys had asked well, over there. Well, yeah. next up, oh, actually, part of AJ's, he says, Do you have a favorite drummer? And who is and why? Why are they your favorite drummer? Who is it and why? Well, you know, I have a lot of great, I play with a lot of great drummers. I play, you know, I played with, um, um, man, he's gonna kill me, and he's passed. The New Orleans drummer that, that was in the Wrecking Crew, and he's from New Orleans, Earl Palmer. Earl Palmer. Earl Palmer, you know, because he goes back, to, my father passed in November, but Earl Palmer was from the same generation as my father, you know, and uh, Harold Mason, I played with Harvey Mason, I played with a lot of, a lot of great guys. The guy that I used on my album, my album, Brandino, The Many Faces of Brandino 2. You need to buy it. It's on <laughs> iTunes. Go buy it so I can buy my big house in, in you know, up in the hills just like Warren did, okay? A anyway. My, my big house. Yeah, your big I house, man. Yeah. It's about this big. I, you love, know, it. I love it. <laughs> but, but yeah, but the drummer I've been using is a, a, a guy named Oscar Seaton that's working with Lionel Richie. He's been with Lionel Richie for five years. And the thing about Oscar... We were doing a, a Grammy party for a good friend of mine, John Beasley. I've known John since he was 13. He moved in this town. We were doing something at uh, uh, the, uh, the club downtown, the Japanese club downtown. I forgot the name of it. Anyway, we were doing that, and basically we kind of hit it off. And he said, man, you know, we need to get a band together. I said, well, yeah, but you're always on the road. He said, well, we need to get a band together. And uh, the one thing I like about Oscar, I found out that Oscar basically played the Chitlin circuit in Chicago with Ramsey Lewis, mm. which is the same thing I did with Jimmy Smith, the organ player, when I was coming up. Oh, Jimmy Smith, amazing. Yeah, yeah I did three albums with him. Oh, fantastic. And I did one of the, one of the did two albums that were live at his club, because he had a supper club of, on Van, in Van Nuys mm -hmm. that he used to have barbecue ribs and everything. It was, it was the, that was the joint. So the thing about Oscar, he had that same kind of background as I did playing blues and all the, you know, juke joints and all that. So the thing I found out about him, me and him are born on the same day. We're both Virgos. 
were born on Spanish American holiday on the 16th of September. And it was B.B. King's birthday also. Nice. So there's a spiritual because my people come from New Orleans. So anybody know about New Orleans? You got voodoo, you got gris gris, you got all that stuff. And it's the real thing. It comes down the bloodline in your veins. It's not always the color of your skin. It's the bloodline in your blood. So he's on the 16th and I'm on the 16th. And people that have heard us, they've told me this. I, I haven't seen him for six months. He's on the road and I get a gig. You know, I get a gig downtown or at Mambo's Cafe or blah, 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 in Glendale or whatever. And I'll call him and say, are you in town? Can you do this gig? We haven't seen each other for a year. And when we start playing, people say, man, it sounds like you guys have been playing like all last week together. There's just this magic spiritual thing. And I'm going because we're born on the same day, seriously. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, you know, uh, I, I believe in spirit, spirituality, religion, all that other good stuff, positivity, you know, so... You know, we just click, man. We start playing, here's a song, do, 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 do. And it's like, okay, he's there. It's like, it's like this. We're like this, period, on anything, okay. rock, whatever. It's like, after it's done, it's done. It's over. So. That's beautiful. Yeah, well, I got him on my album. So it was, I was grateful, you know, thankful enough that I had him and Andy Langham and all those Michael Thompson and. You know, all these all these great guys that are, you know, Michael O'Neill that just got off the road with Barbara Streisand. and I've known him for forty years, you know. I just called favors, man. So That's amazing. Okay, so next up is <sighs> DMAC the engineer. What do you consider the most important part of playing? The groove, staying in the pocket with the drummer, or the overall performance, or which is the least important? They're all important. Yeah, I was thinking that. Yeah, so there's really... nothing there. Whatever he asked about, they're all important. You can't take one out without utilizing mm -hmm. the other because the groove, mm -hmm. what you're playing, and the, and the eventual outcome of the track relies on, on both of those the, the two previous things I just said for it to happen. That's it. You know what? This is a great question, actually, because it's making me think of something. When, when, when I was playing in bands and recording on tape before... Right. DAWs before the ability. Obviously, we chopped up tape, you know, oh, take, yeah. out, take out sections, move kick drums, but not to the extent that we can now. Right. The job of the bass player and the drummer was to create an overall groove, which means it wasn't always necessarily the bass player playing exactly with the kick, right. but maybe if it was it just had that had to drive and right. had to gut. Right. And then the drummer could push and pull against it. Exactly. Yeah. Give and take. Yeah, give and it's take. Give and take in the groove. But the base, the basic thing with the drummer, I mean with the bass player, depending on how many people are in the group, mm -hmm. the more people in the group, you end up playing less. Yeah. Unless it's featured. Mm -hmm. Because you got all this stuff that you have to support. So whole notes, just like I told you about my teacher said on a movie date, Nat Gangurski said, 90% you you're playing whole notes. It's because the bottom line, you're playing the f foundation of the tetrachord that's, that's being orchestrated by sure. the orchestrator, whatever. You can't play anymore because, you know, if I do a G and you know, and you have this on top, and, but if I change it and I go A flat, the tetrachord has changed. Because if you're on the piano, you play A flat and you still got this G major seven on top, it, it becomes another, it becomes something that's unsolv unsolvable. Yeah. Seriously, it becomes, yeah. so wherever you change, the note that that bass player changes, which is related on a keyboard, if you're sitting there, will change the tetrachord. It changes the whole harmonic scenario. So the bottom line is, you know, I've always found the less people in the group, the more you play. And you can get away with it because you won't be stepping on as many people's toes. Mm -hmm. The more people you have, the more you'll be playing whole notes or root or sure. fifths or Absolutely. sevenths. I mean, really, that's it. Root thirds fifths and possible sevens. I do like his question though, because it's making us think about groove. Because I think that that, actually I don't think, I really strongly believe like a lot of music at the moment, the groove is taking a real serious back seat because everything is being so overcorrected. Right. So, you know, when I listen to classic Motown and soul and jazz that yeah. we grew up loving, it, you you don't, you think about as, you think about the song as an overall feeling. I yeah. don't. I don't sit there and pinpoint instruments right. in the right. same way I do now. Right. Right. Like my ear now is on modern music. I think the clarity and the perfection in the recording is probably a little bit of that because now everything is so yeah. precise. Yeah. Yeah. And well, you got kids dealing with iPods. Yeah. You know, they, you know, twenty-two. You know, twenty-two hertz 
That's all they're gonna get off of if they get 44.1k. Maybe right. off of the new ones, but you know what I'm saying. It's so compressed, everything's so compressed, and everything is so mobilized. You know, having a f file that's an AIF file, you know, that's 47 megs, it ain't gonna happen. You yeah. know, so the bottom line is everything's more compressed. Music's so more compressed. You know, it's not like you have that open sound and you have that analog tape, you know, going through, you know, tubes, or let's say when Capitol Records was gonna have a problem, Capitol Records, as you know, when you used to have those spring reverbs that were like the size mm -hmm. of, a, of a road case, you sure. know, and Capitol Records, you know, what I was told, I know the offices got bought out, but supposedly the city was able to keep it as a historic, sure. yeah. you know, landmark. And that reverb chamber that they have oh, down, the lot, yeah. that downstairs mm -hmm. is still there because it's classic because it's a reverb, I don't know, I've never been down there, but it's a reverb chamber that's natural, that's been on every Beatles record, every blah, blah, blah record that ever came out of Capitol Records. You know, it's down there, and they were able to preserve that because they thought they were going to lose it, you know. So that's that old school thing when you're talking about new digital technique and, and old analog, you know. And, and a lot I, actually, I actually heard the Capitol Records, it, the previous administration had sold the building. Right. I, I heard that the new administration is buying it back. So it's going to all be back to owned by Capitol Records. Again. Yeah, good, because yeah. they need to keep it. That's a legend. I oh, mean, yeah. how many hits come out of Capitol Records? Well, plus, you just like, talk about landmark. When you're driving through L.A., oh, 101, yeah, yeah. anything. It's Everybody just, goes there. Oh, yeah. It's a landmark. Yeah. Every yeah. other photograph of L.A. is somebody with, you know, with that man, record just, stack behind I've done you. a lot of dates there, man. It's just, you know, it's historical. And, and the good thing about when you go into a prime studio, which you know what I'm saying. Sure. I mean, you got an SSL in your house. But you know that because of all the great stuff that you, you've done, Warren. But the bottom line is, like, I love going to East-West. That's where I did Justin Timberlake. Mm -hmm. You know, they used to be the old whatever was back in the day, and I can't remember because I worked at Sunset Sound with, with Umberto Gautier, mm -hmm. was the engineer. He wasn't a producer. He was an engineer. Sure. You know, so you know all about that on all that stuff that we used to do. You know, and, and when I did Justin Timberlake, with a full orchestra and everything there, man, it's unbelievable how they did. I mean, it's just, when you go in a room like that, you know it's gonna be great. You just know because they got all the mics. Everybody's on point. Everybody's being nice to you. I mean, they're being overly nice, but you know, they're making <laughs> three to five Gs a day running out or whatever they make. I don't know what they make. But I'm just saying, it's it's top class. That's what you do when you're dealing with top artists like that, you know, because you but, know they know how to record your bass. Exactly, but a lot, a lot of the times now, you're showing up to you know more humble surroundings with your bass, with a DI, with a small amp. You must no, not really. Not getting that many. I don't. Work. I don't do. I really don't do those. Mm -hmm. No, I'm not bragging. I don't really do sure. a lot of home studio thing. I don't do that right. seriously. And last month, or actually January, when I did, well, I am the guy came out, the engineer Patrice. I think Patrice, if that's the right name. If it isn't, hey, call me. I've been looking for you. But the bottom line is he brought out a $15,000 Telefunken, one of those mics like this, and he put it on my bass and he put it three feet away from my upright. I said, how's my bass sound? He goes, I don't have to tell you how your bass sounds, Brandino. You already know how it sounds. But I mean, I hadn't seen one of those like since I was the last time I maybe was recording at Capitol. It was this big and he had it on a boom and it was like, you know, it was like, a, that's the real deal. Mm -hmm. You know, so you know you, I know the bass is gonna sound good. It's prepped, it's been, you know, it's sure. been kept up maintenance wise. But when you see a mic like that, then you already know what what the other components of, sure. of the recording thing's gonna be, you know? So, uh, like I said, realistically, uh, a lot of the stuff I've been doing in the last, whatever, really for, since Outcast in 2004, basically they're all in, Prime, they're all in the big studio. Is it a lot of upright gigs? I do. Uh, it's funny. I'm getting labeled. I was talking to your. You have your friend Dustin. You know Dustin mm -hmm. Brown, your friend, because he's a bass player. He does like rockability, or you know, he's sure. upright. And I was telling him, I'm getting, I'm getting a rep. I think, as the five string upright hip hop bass player, because that's I've been doing all commercial stuff since Outkast. All the records I've been doing are basically mostly Grammy artists, A-list, a, a -list, and I use 
that five string Eastman bass because I, I, I say I play booty bass. That's In all my interviews, I play booty bass. And they say, what's booty bass, Kev? Well, you have to go back to, do you know, to 60s and Motown when people danced and had rhythm. Most kids can't even dance now nowadays. Probably most of the songs you can't dance to anyway. But basically, that's my perception of how I play bass. Mm -hmm. So this five string that I have from Eastman, thank you, Ruben. Thank you, Ping. Um, the bottom line is, you know, when I go in there and I play it, it's like, rah, rah. it's like, you know, it's got this depth to it that's humongous. It's just like this bass that we were explaining, like with the low beat. And it just sits there and ring. Hans, thanks, Hans. I'm glad you made this bass for me. Still use it today, you know. So uh, getting back to the studio stuff. Well, it makes sense in the world of hip hop because everything now, you've got 808 subs, you've got so much low end it's, that a traditional four string is not going to compete. Well, the bottom line is everything is subwoofers. Mm -hmm. I even have a subwoofer in my studio, in, in both my little room and my big room. I mm -hmm. always have a subwoofer. It's because if it don't kick and you don't have that flow underneath it and it's not shaking a Tahoe, it ain't making it. Shaking That's it. That's how it is. If it doesn't, <laughs> if you got a Tahoe that has 15s and they done, the, they done, the, I won't say gangster thing, but they did the hip hop thing to it. You know, they came from rap and all that. You already know what that's about. But what I'm saying, you got a Tahoe that's kicking like that. They, they want to hear that. And so when you get up and you're in your sports car and you get this Tahoe, go, you know, it's like you got to have a car this big to have those kind of speakers to even get that. But that's how they. Oh man, I like that song. They like that song because of what they're feeling. You know, so I've adapted that because I started doing rap before it wasn't rap, you know, and I go back to producing at MCA and at Capitol Records when MCA st signed Heavy D, when it went from R&B to the beginning of rap. I was there during that time. So everything changed and the music changed, you know, so all that stuff changed and how you listen to music. You know, so it just recently with, like I said, with Jeff Hugo from Six Street Feet Under, Six Feet Under, that he wanted me to do this project with him. You know, so I'm going crossing over to this other thing because I've done that before as a kid. I used to do all those classic things. I don't know what I'm doing now, but they say that I like what I do. So, you know, I pulled out an old, you know, six string work that's all jet black. It's gorgeous. It's a gorgeous instrument and it's got to sound like an upright. It sustains that long. I mean, it's unbelievable. And I played it and Jeff sent me this track and I said, OK, I got up at five o'clock one morning. So I got to hear this thing. on." So I did this thing in about a couple hours. I was done with the track and I sent it to Jeff and said, I don't know if you like it. Man, it's great. You know, and I'm, and it's like I hadn't played fretless bass in five years, but it worked for this song. And I did this melody thing and all this. Six it's, string fretless. Yes, yeah, six string fretless by Warwick. You know, and it worked. And he's a Warwick seven string bass player. That's what got me with him because the way he plays, he only plays seven string bass like you do a Chapman stick. And when I heard him doing his thing and he's doing this, I'm going, blah, 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 blah. and I was talking to Chuck Reed. I said, man, look at this kid. He said, I like what this guy's doing. I said, I like what the guy's doing too. And we're all sitting there at Bass Player Live one thing, and he's doing a, you know, a solo thing and he's doing this. And this. But it all makes sense and harmonically it's making sense. And I said, you know what? I got a seven string bass made years ago. I usually just play it for basically piccolo, guitar, melody, things or whatever. I said, but whatever you're doing, Jeff, is great. You know, uh, man, I don't play like that. I don't want to learn how to play like that because I still got problems doing my whole tones and, and my long bows doing, yeah, one, two, three. I'm still doing that at this age. Uh, because you never know when you're going to get that thing that they don't want you to break. They want a long palate and they don't want a breath in between there. They don't want to break. They don't want to go break and you can hear the break going up. No, they want that whole thing. So you're thinking, man, I'm glad that he told me that because that sometimes that's happened. The count is like, okay, seven, eight, nine. You're going, oh, shoot, I hope I have. No, seriously, <laughs> no, and that's happened. It. You yeah. know, so that kind of covers that scenario, you know, from that point of view. So the explosion now, um, Dan Glenn, who's a writer, I mean, who's a guitar player, and I built one of his first bases when, he, when him and uh, Jeff Berlin were going to MI. Mm. He tells me he's been putting all over uh, Facebook that I'm one of the first bass players that made uh, the contra bass for him. Mm. So he's considering a five and six string as a contra bass. Now there's guys playing 21 string bass. I say, hey, man, you guys sound great. You got it. 
I ain't in it. <laughs> but he was, he's been doing that like once a month, been doing that, and we've been having conversations. And he's saying, well, yeah, Kev, you know, it's a contra base because anything over four string in this day and age, even though, even though five and six string became popular, it's an extended range instrument. And it's basically a contra base because you're going lower. And on his base, I made him a six string base with Kenny, Climax, your friend. Yep. We did this. And I was telling Kenny, I need to make one, man. You're crazy. I'm not crazy because I ask everybody and they think I'm on drugs. I ain't on drugs. I, I've been playing bass when I was nine years old. I need a, I want a <laughs> piano. I want a bass that I got the range of the piano. Well, you can't do it unless you have, you know, a nine string bass and you don't, there's no manufacturers that can make strings like that. That ain't going to happen. So basically we started with the low B, mm -hmm. you know, and then I saw Jimmy Johnson. And when Jimmy Johnson said, okay, call GHS, that was in the seventies, blah, 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 blah. And all that, and I, you know, they started making development strings for me. You know, now, you know, I do Diodario, and then they make five and six string, and and they sound the best. To me, they sound the best on the Wards. They, it's like that Italian German thing. It's like this is German, right. and this is Italian, and the Italian kind of mellows it out, kind of smooths <laughs> it out. You know what I'm saying? Like drink it. We're gonna have some pizza, man. You know, with some vino. You know, I had some of that last night. So it's that kind of thing. So. On all my work bases, I use Diodario because they they just happen to tendency to smooth the instrument out. Right. Smooth. Beautiful. So they sound smooth. Well, I think that was all of our questions. Um, we could talk, and I could listen to you talk for absolutely hours. Yeah, well, you I know you got I know you have a busy schedule, and you push some things back. You, you have know. a busy schedule too. This yeah, is great. well, yeah, I got this thing. I got this, uh, you know, this song I need to do with the Bass Alliance. Yeah, they'll be coming out probably maybe the end of this year or next year, uh, you know, featuring Jeff, uh, Hugo, and I think Mike Mannerin is is on it too, uh -huh. and I think Alberto Regini from Italy, he's on it. This it's a base. It's going to be a a, coll a base collective album of what I've been told of Warwick and GK and Dorsey's. That's what I've been told. Well, what I'd like, yes, is to hear some more playing. Okay, well, so... Uh, I think our viewers are... Well, okay, well, yeah, but, you know... Uh... Oh, yeah, I cut my finger, so I'm still trying to get it together, but at least I took the Band-Aid off. Excuse me, I almost hit you. Hold on. play i mean you know i mean we we you know we can sit here for hours about scales major minor scales augmented diminish you know blah 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 okay how about this i remember my first studio experience and i i, I could pretty pretty much play the first thing i ever recorded that stuck in my mind because i remember being so nervous about going in there yeah playing. okay yeah is there anything any like line that is to you is like a memorable line that you put on a record it doesn't have to be the first one it could be anything that you just keep coming back to the, I don't know, that you're proud of. Something that is like a line that just sticks in your mind. Uh, now, you, now you got me, now you got me blushing, man. And blush. You know, because I, pff, hey, I, I, pff, I mean, I, I, pff, I'm kind of speechless at this point. I figured, you, I didn't think you would ask that. And, I, and people ask me all the time. And I just tell them, I pretty much, I, you know, the only, the, the, there was, there was one thing that I've always done, which I don't have my pedal board, but the thing that I got away with, let's say, <laughs> is a uh, 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 Freeway Love, which is a... Uh, and usually, 
the big thing about that is that I used basically a rolling octave divider back in the day when Roland first came out with it. And the thing is, is that I covered the synth bass line live and in the studio, whenever we went in the studio, I covered it with that octave divider, which pretty much at that point, uh, that was like the first, um, the first octave dividers that they made. So they didn't really track as well as they did now. So basically you never got the second octave. The second octave never worked. Hmm. The first octave worked. So basically I was playing like, but the bottom line is I was playing. So I was getting this low D at that time when there was really no five and six string basses. Mm. They were just coming in to play at that point. So you were getting that, which is where the synth bass basically was where it was outlined. Correct. You know, it was down there. So I mean, that thing, you know, um, I, I, I made a lot of money with that octave divider. And I told <laughs> and with rolling all the rolling equipment, because you figured back then, you know, then before Marcus really came into the session thing, it was Anthony Jackson. And Anthony Jackson was known for you using FEX, DC 300, you know, all this stuff that basically back then cost a lot of money. But he was, you know, he, he was the number one guy in New York. So, you know, I used a lot of rolling pedals back in the day. And um, basically- Was this Roland or Boss? No. Well, Roland was Roland. Yeah. Boss was part of Roland that yep. they developed. Then yep. they became two separate entities. So this is pre of use to Boss. So this is like the Roland pedal. Oh yeah, this is like when Roland first came. When when they even got the um, uh, Mr. Takahashi when he f came over to the U.S. and Tom Beckman c was able to buy or become the distributor for Roland in the U.S. and in Canada. This one Mother's Bow with Devo. Mm -hmm. the, the, when they were working for Roland. This is oh. all good. This is like when first Rollins got here to the US. Sure. I was there back then because my friend Ro that I was talking about, Chris Bristol, that that um that I talked about that ran Roland, who just basically I guess retired or whatever two or three years ago. Basically, he was the number one salesman for Saul. You remember who Saul Bettman was? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well I met him at thirteen at Saul Bettman's. Oh, wow. So basically when Ro Roland got de developed, or when Roland actually came to the U.S., let, let, let me make this clear, clear. When Roland came to the U.S., he was hired because he was the top salesman in L.A., period, for everybody knew who he was. So they hired him, and he was the top salesman at Roland for years and years and years. So the bottom line is he, had he would call me and call Lee, and Lee Scalar, hey, man, we got this bass synth. We got this. So the first bass synth that was ever done in 78 or whatever, you know, I went to New Orleans to demo it at the NAMM show. You know, the, and it was one pedal that all you did is set the dials and you had a, you had a, a volume knob that, that would open up the VCO. You know, rawr, and that's all you had. I mean, you had to sit down there and once you press that pedal in, whatever preset you had, that's all you had. So me and Mike Thompson, because I met Mike when he came from Berkeley. And we were playing at either Josephina's or one of the clubs that was on the strip on Ventura. And I used to sub for Leon Gare. Because Leon, I don't know if you know who Leon Gare is, bass player. Well, Ring bell. Yeah, well, he was, he, the bass and the synth bass on, on um, the Italian guy, um, Brother to Brother. You know who I'm talking about, legendary album. Well, Leon had spent, I think, about 15 grand trying to get single oscillators off of, uh, at Oberheim, the trigger bass. Oh, interesting. So I'm trying to think of this guy's name, man. Every, every, people will know I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Gino Vanelli. That oh, Gino Vanelli. Yeah, the groundbreaking album. Yeah, Tommy Vaccari. Yeah, all that. Yeah. So basically, Leon had played on that album, played mm -hmm. on that hit song, mm -hmm. and he was triggering something right. that he had made and spent the money because he was basically, he, did, he was a studio brat right. and was doing studio work at 13. Oh, wow. Yeah, he was doing it way back then. So he had enough money. He built something. He was like the first guy. So Roland eventually came with Mother's Bow and all them with all their technology. They came in. So basically, they hired me to go to New Orleans to do the first Roland bass synth. And so that's how me and Michael Thompson 
because Leon would be in the, hey, Kev, I got the thing at Josephina, why don't you cover for me? Okay, no problem. So I met Michael Thompson. Michael Thompson was ripping, you know, he was ripping Jimi Hendrix to the T. And we're playing, I'm, at that point, I have, a, I have a Sun cabinet with two 15s with a DC 300, you know, running all, at Josephina's or, uh, uh, man, I keep saying Josephina, it might have been another club, but anyway, that's what I remember. And man, and, and we were playing straight rock or cover songs, you know, and that thing is blistering. I got 300 watts with 215 pushing in the club and he's just ripping. He's got long hair down here and he's just ripping. Ooh, he's just ripping. I said, man, I ain't never heard. I heard Hendrix live in 69. I have never heard another guitar player play like this with as much soul except you. You're the first one in there. He was just ripping, just ripping after ripping. I mean, all whatever. He had all that stuff going on, man. So, you know, that's, 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 that's kind of our bond. So when I asked him to play on my record, he says, Kev, he says, man, it sounds great. So he gave me the stuff, cut it up. I cut it up and put it in, you know, cut and paste. He said, man, you did all that from that little stuff I played? He said, man, write some more stuff. He said, people don't let, they don't really know. They hire, hire me to play studio guitar, but I don't get to play leads. And on that album, which is called Rocket, you'll be able to listen to it. He done burned. He just did a classic thing, man. He burned. You know, I could, he couldn't ask for nothing better. Wonderful. All right, I'm going to check it out. Thanks for bringing it over. Oh, no, it's all right. My, it's, it's, my, it's, it's my, uh, my pleasure since you invited me to your lovely studio over here up in the hills, you know. <laughs> that sounds so, so beautiful. Oh, yeah, it is beautiful up here, you know. I mean, you know, you, you got to have a couple of hit records to do something to, to kind of even. Man, what's your qualifications? Of, well, I got a house I just bought on, you know, up on, on, on Hillcrest up there on the mountains. Yeah, well, what's your credibility? Well, I just, yeah, I just did something with Iggy Pop. Okay, you're, yeah, you're accepted. You can move up here. <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff, you know. It's all good. I'm not mad. <laughs> Marino, it's wonderful to have you come back. No, man, Thank I'm, you, I'm man. glad that you, that you asked me to do this and everything. Hopefully, Thank you. Thank I you did a good time. job. Oh, no, it's You know, hopefully I didn't uh, act correctly. You know, everybody's, you know, all my people said, oh, yeah, Brandino behaved himself. Yeah, I behaved <laughs> myself. You know, it was that wine I had. Like, I had a glass of Chianti last night, so I was feeling nice and mellow this oh, morning. Oh, right, good, yeah, sort of. Yeah, you know, you know. Rolling um, over to um, the um, You know, all that was happening, you know, and all that. As ever, please leave a bunch of comments and questions below. Uh, I might hit you back up to answer some. No, that's all right. Anything, whatever I can do for you, Warren. Well, I, I do appreciate it because we had uh, so much of that good time over there with your friends Bob Horn and over there at the studio. Yeah, we were, and my party, yeah, Sunset. Yeah, we were we, we, yeah. Yeah, we were having fun and clowning and everything. Yep. And Randy Fugues, hello Randy, you know, hey, everyone's there and all that. You had a good old time, you know, so hey man. Wonderful. All right, thank you once again, I really appreciate thank it. Thank you, Warren, it's my pleasure anytime. As ever, please leave a bunch of comments and questions below. Thank you ever so much for watching. Uh, this has been a lot of fun, I've learned a lot from this, thank you.